I was not wearing a hijab before okay. when I was elected in 2015 I was not wearing a hijab okay. I was diagnosed with cancer in 2018 right. and it was after that I started wearing a hijab and uh, when after my treatment when I started going out into public events in August 2018 um, I was attacked on social media when I put one picture okay. of a legion that you are why are you taking your Islamic ideology to our legion There are certain core stereotypes uh, that have been present for not only uh, in uh, the, the period preceding 9-11 in the 20th century, but for generations, for centuries. And these have been present in, uh, in literature, uh, in art, in music, uh, and later on, uh, in the early 20th century. In the earliest films, uh, you see uh, Muslims presented uh, in a violent manner. For example, one of the earliest uh, films, a silent film, uh, called The Sheik, mispronounced of course, The Sheik, uh, in which a major uh, Hollywood star, Rudolf Valentino, took part, and acted out the main uh, part, the lead, uh, in which he was presented as kidnapping a European woman. So again, abduction, violence, uh, violence towards women, uh, and the dynamic between Arab men, white women, European women. But even leading up to that, think about, you know, the Iron Wall had come, or the, yeah, the Iron Wall had come down. We didn't have, you know, the big bad East, uh, the communists any longer to, uh, to fear. So um, we did sort of go in search for a, a new enemy, a new uh, scapegoat, if you will. And so I think even before 2001, um, we were certainly seeing more of this vilification of Arabs generally, uh, and by extension then, uh, Muslims, in the media, in movies. I mean, that became the fair. It wasn't, you know, the James Le Carre, James Le Carre? Le Carre, uh, you know, novels and, and movies about the uh, Eastern spies, the communist spies, didn't have that same resonance. So now we were turning to uh, movies that revolved around terrorists. Uh, and they were brown uh, and uh, presumed to be uh, Muslim. So it really predates 2001. But of course, the 9-11 attacks really exacerbated uh, the problem. And in particular, the way the, the U.S., especially uh, responded to those attacks. Um, you know, for the first time, they were subject to the m sort of massive uh, terrorist, act of terrorism that had, had challenged so many countries uh, in the Middle East, um, but it had come home to roost. And so uh, there was a real uptick in Islamophobia from politicians, uh, from the media, and from the broader public uh, as well. Uh, anyone who they perceived to be Muslim. So that that really meant brown people uh, generally because Arabs were so closely uh, associated so religion and race really became uh, closely connected there this goes back about almost 20 years now but since that time you know the association or the the storyline and the narrative in the media associating terror to Muslims and to the uh, Islamic faith um, it began around that time, and uh, it's remained uh, very much a part of the world. It's become the sort of go-to stereotype. Um, even to this day, if you think about somebody who is a quote-unquote terrorist, even though that can be a very broad range of people going from white extremists to people of uh, uh, Jewish background, of Hindu background, Buddhists in um, Burma, and you know, it, it can, can range across the globe, the go-to stereotype still kind of um, tends to stain the the Islamic faith and people are Muslims in general uh, with that with that label. Um, so there's the media, then there's the social media, um, which exposes more people to more kinds of narratives, uh, uh, including those about uh, uh, about um, Muslims and immigrants. And that's the interesting thing, how the two become, uh, you know, sort of collapse together so that the immigrant crisis uh, that uh, people are, are, are so worried about um, is also a Muslim 
crisis, um, that there are, there are too many. It's 3.2% of the population. Estimates, when you ask people what, uh, this is one opinion poll just in the last little bit, uh, ask people what proportion of the population uh, is now Muslim, and uh, you know they'll guess up to 40% of the population. So there's just that lack of knowledge, that lack of awareness. And then the third piece, and this is funneled through the media, of course, is the impact of Donald Trump as president uh, and his campaign for the leadership of the party and then his campaign for presidency and, and since then even real blatant vilification of Muslims uh, as criminals, uh, as terrorists, as, as inherently dangerous people. There are ways of dealing with the other, but you, if you're committed to the idea of the other being completely different, completely alien, then you will show them as in, in a completely different way from what you see the self as. So uh, the self will be dressed and be presented in particular visuals, particular ways, and the other will constantly be shown as different from the West, from Western people. Uh, so people constantly in traditional dress, women in burqas, uh, in hijabs and so on, and even though 50% of Muslim women don't wear burqas or, or hijabs. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, that doesn't exist. You cannot be a Muslim in the media, uh, in media presentations, if you do not have traditional dress. Then the way that people may be shown uh, around mosques, so often uh, a media story about uh, terrorism, uh, terrorism committed by Muslims, will have certain visuals of people praying. And often uh, the larger the group of people praying, the better, because it's seen as a threat. And somehow this connects the religion of people praying in a very peaceful manner to the violence, to the terrorism. So we, it's, it's not stated, it's not overt, but it is um, indicated anyway by indicating these kinds of visuals. The power of the visual is is extreme, right? We've seen the ways in which pictures go viral, in which they're easily reproduced, they become memes, you know, people circulate them widely, and I think that that does have a tremendous influence now. Media coverage of um, uh, Justine Bork's uh, sh killing murder of two RCMP officers in Moncton just about the same time as Zahaf Bebo uh, attacked Parliament Hill and um, uh, Kachil Rallo uh, attacked two servicemen, killed one serviceman by running a car into them uh, in Quebec. And the, f the last two were considered terrorism. The first one wasn't, in spite of the fact that he was very much informed by right-wing ideologies, by anti-state uh, anti uh, ideologies, classic, classic ideological motivations for his violence. That's terrorism. Same thing with the with the mosque shootings. There was a real hesitancy uh, to describe that as an act of terrorism, or even describe it as hate crime. Well, I think that there has been a lot of attention both to Muslim men and to Muslim women, but I think in particular there seems to be an ongoing fascination with Muslim women. And this stretches back quite a while. I don't know if, it, I think we can certainly say that it's intensified after September 11th, but there does seem to be historically a real fascination with Muslim women in the way in which they dress, the ways in which they might be considered perhaps different from women in North America or I guess um, the way in which we perceive women in North America and Europe to be. What is the fascination with that? What is the political significance of the burkini in the lives of most people? Probably very little. And yet we're fascinated by this expression of difference. It seems in some way to offend many people. And yet, objectively speaking, how is the hijab harmful to most of us? I don't believe that it is. Uh, in the same way that I think many of us would look at a nun and not find anything very problematic about the way in which she's covered. Uh, people express their culture differently or their devotion differently. And yet, for some reason, there is something about the hijab that seems in many ways to be a kind of flashpoint for debates around multiculturalism, about difference, about the ways in which people can or cannot express their religiosity that I find to be both peculiar and troubling. Uh, I do know that some media outlets do really good work in terms of trying to provide um, Canadian Muslims an opportunity to talk and share their stories. That being said, certainly we know that there is dis disproportionate coverage, um, for instance, of uh, terrorism conflated with Islam and Muslims versus, for instance, far-right uh, extremism or white supremacy. We know that. 
We know um, that uh, over, over the years, um, while there has been some improvement, we will still see examples where, you know, for instance, there was a story a few years ago that suggested that um, mosques had problematic, very, very problematic literature, and it was done by, uh, you know, a, an individual who had an agenda against Muslims, and it was covered by mainstream media as though it was legitimate a scholarship, when it was not. So there are definitely examples of poor media practices around many diverse communities, um, but definitely with Muslim communities there have been issues uh, and we hope that they will get addressed. On the airwaves, in the newspapers, on television, Muslims have consistently been portrayed as a threat. We owe it to the families of Ibrahim Berry, Mamadou Tanu Berry, Khalid Belkachemi, Abu Bakr Thabti, Abdul Karim Hassan and Azuddin Sufyan to try. And we owe it to ourselves. Thank you.